Hi, I'm Kirby Allison, uh, and today I'm at a very special place. I'm at Hunters in Francau, uh, someplace I thought I would never have the privilege uh, to come visit, let alone to sit down with its managing family member, Jimma Freeman. And Hunters in Francau has been involved in the Cuban tobacco business for well over 225 years uh, and is currently serving as the exclusive importer of Cuban cigars into the United Kingdom. Jimma, thank you so much for inviting us in. I mean, this is, uh, this is too much for me. Well, it, it's really good to have you here. And, and I'm, I feel very privileged that this is one of the places you wanted to visit <laughs> while you were in London. So You're too welcome. Kind of, the privilege is, is ours. I mean, whenever I think of uh, Cuban tobacco, uh, you know, the Britain has always been, you know, really the market. It's been the preeminent destination for the finest Cuban cigars for well over a century. And you can probably speak, you know, for the past two and a half centuries. Well, I mean, C Cuban cigars here didn't really take off until the 1800s. If you, if you look back at figures, the import figures were very low up until the sort of 1840s when there was a huge spike as a result of what I was always told was the British soldiers meeting the Spanish soldiers in the Peninsula War huh. um, and, and adopting this habit of cigar smoking. And then what followed on from there was the cigar divans that grew up and the coffee, all, all the all the sort of environment around cigar smoking. So before that, we were a relatively small consumer of the mm -hmm. Cuban cigar. But I think you're right, for various reasons, the UK has always had a, had a sort of position as a beacon in the Cuban cigar world. Um, and I think a lot of that is to do with the fact that we have a very traditional history of mm -hmm. well-established um, what, what would one call them specialists yeah. in, in, the, in the sort of looking after and care and selling of yeah. cigars in this market. Well, and, and I think in many ways, whenever I think of the Cuban cigar culture, it has always been woven into the fabric socially here in the United Kingdom. Yes. Where you had gentlemen in their clubs and at home after dinner, always enjoying a Cuban cigar. Yeah. And so it really took on a, a touch of prestige that I think, again, to this day, uh, distinguishes Cuban cigars from perhaps even New World cigars. Well, I think that's right. It, it has always been a gentleman's, or certainly the large Cuban cigars, have always been a gentleman's pastime. And, and it was very much handed from generation to generation. I mean, when I, when I first worked in the cigar business in J.J. Fox and St. James's as a holiday job, <laughs> You know, men would come in and they would be, I mean, they looked very old to me. They were probably in their 60s, <laughs> looking back on it. But they knew what they smoked. The range wasn't as big as we see it now. Mm -hmm. And they would say, well, I smoke X because my father smoked it. And that's yeah. all I want to see. So could you show me three boxes of Epicure number twos or mm -hmm. Particus D4s? And they would choose one according to the color and they would leave. And, and I think that is one of the things that shifted so much is this interest in experimenting, particularly with Cuban cigars, yeah. whether it's flavors or brands or sizes or shapes or age, that has moved on. Because if you, if you look back at some of the cigars that we find in cellars, which, is a, which has been a great sort of boon for the UK, mm -hmm. is all these cigars that get discovered in the cellars of big houses where they've been quietly for many. I need one of those cellars. We all need one of those cellars, <laughs> but it would it would probably be two or three sizes of cigars yeah. that didn't have the sort of the, the interest in experimenting um, that we see now, yeah. which is a which is a big difference, I think. But there's a massive, I mean again one of the things I love about London and Cuban cigars is there's a massive enthusiast culture in collectors. Yes. You know, that really are uh, you know seeking out nuanced and rare and uh, unusual cigars, yeah. uh, and not just focusing on one or two uh, Vitolas. No, and, and funny enough, that, that collecting of cigars, I think, can be sort of traced <coughs> back to the convention that there always was in the UK of you went to your cigar merchant and you would buy your cigars, but he would look after them for you for a couple of years before hmm. you took them home to smoke uh. them. So there was the culture of... Aging. I've got it, yeah. but I'm not going to consume it yet, mm. of aging. And I think once you start that process of putting things on one side, I think that's what starts you off as a collector. Yes, indeed. Whether it's wine or records mm -hmm. or books, you start to build up and you get tempted. You think, well, maybe I'll just put one of those 
in, in my keep, we'll put one of those. So places like J.J. Fox and Davidoff, you know, they, particularly J.J. Fox, in fact, and Dunhill, would store a lot of cigars for people. Mm -hmm. And then they would go and take them and take them to their homes and keep a box or two at a time. Yeah. And these cigar merchants themselves have been around for a long time. Oh, I mean, J.J. Fox is exceptionally old. Incredibly old. And, and, you know, has gone from generation to generation looking after generation after generation mm -hmm. of, of cigar lovers' cigars and done a brilliant job of it. And yeah. that, you know, their history, you go into their museum where you've got the chair that Winston Churchill mm -hmm. sat in and the ledger from his orders. You know, you can, you can really feel what you referred to earlier, which is the history of it yeah. here. The history and the tradition. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And one of the other things that I think, there's two dynamics that, again, just absolutely uh, leave me in awe of just the cigar culture here in the United Kingdom. One is the one that you just spoke about is that you've got these multi-generational, family-run businesses that continue to be family runs and it allows them to run their business differently than if you were owned by a large corporation. It allows them to be caretakers and custodians of the tradition. But on the flip side, you've got a lot of new energy. I mean, Davidoff of London, of course, opening in the 80s, right? You've got all these incredible cigar lounges that have come about uh, after 2007. Uh, and, you know, despite this absolutely incredible storied history and tradition, there's still a lot of new energy and excitement going on right now. I couldn't agree with you more. And, and it's that contrast that you always feel in this business between the old and the new. And, you know, as you said, we've got families like the Saharkins, Davidoff and J.J. Fox, the Fox family, who, who've been in the cigar business for a very, very long time. And then, like you say, you've got the younger generation coming in, and it's not just in retail that we see the younger generation. I think one of the areas that we've been most excited by in the last sort of 15, 16 years has been since the smoking ban came in, 2007, we've sort of worked quite hard with the market to keep cigars in the catering sector. And the origin of cigars in the catering sector was really, you know, we, we sort of pioneered that when we were the distributor for Davidoff. Mm -hmm. And the, the thinking was that if you're in a nice restaurant and you've had a nice meal and a humidor comes around between the tables, it's a, it's a bit like sort of dominoes. You take a cigar and the next table says, well, I'll have one of those. So we did a lot of work with the catering industry. When was that? Because that was back that when was you could 70s, smoke. 80s, when you could 90s, smoke inside. early 2000s, yeah. all of that. So, you know, a lot of the businesses we dealt with were hotels and restaurants as well. Mm -hmm. And when the smoking ban came in, we saw that sort of collapse overnight. You know, everybody was saying there's no future for cigars and catering. It's going to affect the retail trade. So, you know, 2007. And there were two businesses in London that said, hold on, we've got some outdoor space. Let's do something with mm -hmm. this. Let's take the roof. Let's take the garden. What was the first one? The, the first one, it was a sort of, it was a close tie, I think, between Boysdale of Belgravia and the Lanesborough Hotel. Okay. And Ranald at Boysdale had this amazing roof terrace. And he had been very involved in the campaign that we had worked on at that time to limit the restrictions on smoking cigars. Mm -hmm. And in the end, we didn't manage to do that. And it was restricted to just outside or sampling in very specific circumstances. But Ranald managed to get permission. And the most difficult thing for Ranald was he was surrounded by London neighbours who were yeah. worried about noise and chaos. Mm -hmm. Anyway, he built this terrace and people came. Yeah. They did. And we, we created this acronym, COSA, Comfortable Outdoor Smoking Areas. <laughs> and then it was the Lanesborough that said, you know, we've got this car park area at the back of the Lanesborough. It's effectively redundant space. Why don't we see what happens if we make a cigar terrace? And they made one of the most beautiful cigar terraces. They took it to the next level for sure. They took it to the next level. And they had had the cigar library before that. So for them, cigars had been quite significant business. Mm -hmm. And with <coughs> someone like the Lanesborough, we, we, we learned from them. Well, we knew it, but actually it was in conversation with them that this came out, that the sales that you were doing if you were selling a cigar in somewhere like the Lanesborough, were really just a small part of your custom with that person. Mm -hmm. So it's probably the person that was staying in a very nice room. It's 
probably the person that was drinking very nice wine. It was probably the person that was drinking good whiskey and doing a lot of entertaining. Therefore, the value to someone like the Lanesborough of a cigar smoker couldn't just be quantified the by the cigars. 25 cigars yeah. you sold him in a mm -hmm. couple of months. You had to look at it as a whole. Yeah. And once, once that became an established thought process for people and they realised how much they were losing by not having the cigar smokers come through their doors, mm -hmm. the places that did offer facilities for cigar smokers did unbelievably well. So the Lanesboroughs said that their biggest rooms and suites were inevitably rented out to cigar smokers. Yeah. And on it went from there, and then we saw a domino effect yeah. of everybody started to look at their outdoor space. Um, and I think there are now over 300 what we call causes in, well, it's in very the UK. Active. Yeah, you ha we had to be very active, and and the the exciting thing about it was that the retailers were doing okay because a lot of people that bought cigars in hotels and restaurants. Were pushed, started, to were pushed to retailers. Yeah. And yet you had the caterers finding a whole new life for cigar mm -hmm. smokers. And I think the other point that was absolutely key was it, it cemented the, the sort of crossroads between cigars and cigarettes. Because what happened with businesses, mm -hmm. catering businesses, hotels, restaurants, members clubs, is the cigarette smoker didn't didn't deliver any added value to them. Mm -hmm. So it was much better for them to have an area that dedicated to, to the cigars. cigar smoker than yeah. it was to have a terrace or a bench for the cigarette smoker. Mm -hmm. And I think that has been really fundamental in the last 15 years, is that change between, or, or the splitting up of the definition of a smoker. It's become much more tangible, I think. Cigarette smoker, mm, cigar smoker, yeah. great. You know. Well, there's a big distinction between cigarette smoking and cigar smoking that uh, I guess is nuanced maybe, perhaps. Um, and so therefore there's not many people that really understand it. No. But a cigar smoker couldn't be any more different than a cigarette smoker. No. Uh, and the way that the smoke itself lingers or how offensive one may consider it uh, is night and day. Yes, and, and of course the, the process of making a cigar is so fundamentally mm. different to the process of making a cigarette. Yeah. I mean, they both come from the same plant, the tobacco yeah. plant. But, you know, it's a bit like saying, well, I'm not going to make a comparison to yeah. cheap vodka. But I mean, you know, yes. it, it, it is the same thing. You almost can't compare the two yeah. to each other. Yeah. Um, well. And I think that is the beauty of the, the cigar, well, the process of smoking a cigar, but also the cigar smoker to me is someone who, is, who really understands the value of time. Mm -hmm because it takes time, as to we know, to smoke a cigar. So you, you, you choose to allocate some of your time to the enjoyment of smoking a cigar. And in a way, it almost shouldn't be called smoking, because to me, smoking suggests, yeah. you know, you take it right in and take mm -hmm. it out. Whereas with a, with a cigar, you're literally tasting the yes. smoke. It's a different, yeah. it, it's a different experience mm -hmm. completely. Well, I really like that sentiment that, uh, that smoke a cigar is really just tasting it. Uh, and then, you know, again, just the commitment to time in good company, right? Because that's what smoking a cigar for me really represents. I agree. Is a commitment to time, yeah. commitment to spending that time with someone or even with yourself in your own thought. But it does slow down life. It slows down and life. It forces you yeah. to stop and savor the moment. And I, I very rarely see somebody, you know, in a sort of stress situation. Mm standing on the corner of the yeah. street with a, with a cigar in their mm. hands. You know, there's a, there's, it, it's, it has a quality to it. Speaking of which, oh, Herbie, boy. Um, we, have a, we have a small selection of cigars here, <laughs> which I, I will... You've got access to a few. <laughs> <laughs> Which I How does one like yourself even <laughs> begin to choose? <laughs> I, uh, well, it's quite easy for me because I like very specific sizes and shapes, so okay. it narrows it right down uh. for me. So I, I tend to stay in a, in a similar area. Um, but in terms of what I thought you might like to smoke today, I've bought up a selection of our House Reserve okay. cigars. And House Reserve was a project that we started um, five or six years ago. The idea of it was that we have kept in our reserves certain cigars for 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30. Can only imagine. On and on years. <laughs> um, and those cigars are a combination of things. They, they may be cigars that 
were the first release from Cuba. So they were the first batch we got. And over time, we've observed that that first batch is often made in the flagship factory mm -hmm. or the brand home of that cigar. So we would keep a quantity of those. Some of them, to be honest, have been cigars that may have been slower sellers 10, 15, 20 years ago. But as we know, with cigars, fashion changes. Um, others will have been reservers or grand reservers. Mm -hmm. And then what we've done is we started to release about 5,000 of those twice a year. Yeah. So what we do with those cigars, and I think probably this is a nice box to show you. This is the um, Cote which is, Breast Blendido. Which is difficult to understand because, or comprehend, or appreciate, because Hunters and Francao already is in, our, in many ways receiving the best of the Cuban cigars. Anyway, yes. Uh, anyway. Yeah. And then to you know, age it or to select even finer of that, I mean, yeah. the preeminence of these uh, is, well, is really hard to comprehend. And it's a joy. I mean, as a, as a, as a process, as, as, as you, know, you know, we have very, very strict quality control procedures. And that, that is for really for two reasons. One is because traditionally EMS, English market selection, which we use on our boxes of cigars to, to differentiate mm -hmm. them, that was, that was a term that Cuba used for cigars allocated to the UK. And, and the convention says that UK, because we were fussier, got the top <laughs> level of cigars. But I remember the first time I went to Cuba in the mid 90s with my father and we went to a cigar factory and in the room they had the bundles of cigars with different colored ribbons on okay and i asked what the different ribbons were and this and they said well the pink ribbon's the best they go to england <laughs> so you know he he may have been saying that to keep me happy <laughs> but the ems the quality here is really important so we open every box when when we when they arrive from cuba we do 100% checking of every cigar. We then keep them in the bonded warehouse. And when they come up to London to be distributed, they get checked again. Mm -hmm. And it's at that point that they receive the EMS sticker. So it's yeah. on the second 100% check. And also with the, with the tax structure in this market, our cigars have until now been much more expensive than in other markets. So you have to take out the bad yeah. cigars. And when I say bad cigars, I mean, you know, you think about a cigar that's made five years ago in Havana, mm -hmm. and it's gone all around the world to get here, and it might have a split wrapper on it mm -hmm. by now. So we need to take that out of the box. Yeah. That renders that box unsaleable. Mm -hmm. So all the cigars get put aside. But anyway, this process with House Reserve, we've identified cigars that, that are old or special. We've then had Cuban quality technicians come over and conduct another- Really? unbelievably thorough check Cubans, Cubans from, yeah. from, from Habanos SA yeah. or from Taba Cuba to uh -huh. be precise. Um, so that process takes months for them. They take every cigar out, they inspect every cigar, they have a method of checking the draw without you know, lighting a cigar. Um, so you know, we lost a few along the way, but to date we haven't had any trouble with these cigars. So. And so will they combine boxes then, like if, no, if one... No, if you lose two cigars out of a box, that box is gone. Because the colour grading of a box mm. means that you can't just blend in other cigars. Mm. Because the specialists in Cuba have, in, in any box of cigars, you will only have one of 70 tones of brown. And even within that box, it will go light to dark to okay. represent the leaf. It's amazing. So, A, that would be inappropriate, because it, you're putting in a cigar that hasn't been, hasn't grown up with the other mm. cigars in that box. And also we would never have the selection of colors to be able to match yeah. it. So if we lose cigars, we lose that whole box. What happens to the box? Hi, I'm Kirby Allison, and today's video was brought to you by KirbyAllison.com, where you'll find the largest collection of luxury garment care and luxury shoe care accessories in the world, as well as other great clothing accessories for the well-dressed, like this sovereign-grade necktie, pocket squares, braces, socks, and so much more. So if you enjoy the content that we film on this channel, make sure you visit KirbyAllison.com. <laughs> <laughs> well... That's another story. You don't story. have to tell us. <laughs> <laughs> um, but this, bo this box made it through the process, which is good. So we put a, we put a sticker so on saying... So it's quite a high standard. I mean, that's a very high oh, threshold. Yes. A very, very high threshold. And, and you need that because these are not 
these are not inexpensive by now. I yeah. mean, this box was manufactured in 2002 and released from our house reserve in December 2021 and has 15 years of age on it. So, I mean, it's already a very desirable cohiba to begin with. Well, the Esplendidos yeah. at the moment is desirable. And then, then we put a foot band on, which we'll see in a moment, just so that you can recognize it if you want to in a shop. If, if, because in, in the UK, as you know, a lot of retailers sell cigars singly. So you need to have the cigars yeah. accessible to consumers one by one, as well as in a box. But in terms of what we might smoke today, I've got some Lanceros, which are part of this program. They're from 2001. It's always interesting to smoke an <laughs> old Lanceros. And this is the original Lancero. This That's the original Lanceros. The yep. bona fide yep. Lanceros. Yep. First, 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 proto well, not prototype, but early early rendition of the Lanceros, so before everything else was added to the box. So we've got those. Wow. That was from our <laughs> December release, or, which I might try because I haven't had one of these yet. This is the Paul Araniaga Monte Carlo, mm. 2007. Yeah. Much smaller, slimmer cigar. But this is a difficult cigar to make, and you don't find these aged yeah. very often. Well, it's quite um, a small ring gauge. It's a tiny ring gauge. 32. Max Falx just wrote an article about those. Uh, you see the 32 key. ring gauge, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, and funny enough, this was a cigar. I mean, we would not have been importing those in 2007 um, because we didn't know about them. <laughs> um, we only found out about these cigars when we were in Cuba for a festival one really? day. We just never picked them up on the <laughs> list. And it was after we'd done the Paul Araniaga Magnifico regional mm. edition then I thought, well, what else is in the Paul Araniaga brand? Because we only knew about the Petty Coronas. Went into a shop, found these, and thought, this, this is really good news. You make a tiny little slim one in a completely different type of box. And that sort of pink strip... They just strip, weren't exporting them. It wasn't that they weren't exporting them. They were on the export list. But the export list is as long as this room. Okay. And so actually, you know, <coughs> you do miss certain things. Yeah. Um, and Paul Araniaga wasn't a brand that existed in many formats or in this market had any great sort of resonance really mm -hmm. until the regional edition came out yeah. and that really sort of started the, 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 you know, the momentum on this brand. And also that sort of bar across to me was always symbolic of a, either short filler or possibly a machine made cigar. Mm -hmm. So if I'd seen that I would have assumed yeah. that that was made with short filler. Yeah. Um, Anyway, this is, uh, you know, the, these can be extraordinary cigars when yeah. they're good. But well, what, I just, what, what I just bought like? two boxes of those. Oh, did you? <laughs> <laughs> Although probably not aged. No. <laughs> certainly not no. from your reserve. No, no, they were And then be. you've got the La, La Reina there, which is... Well, another. I always have the La Reina because this comes from my humidor, which you and saw next That's a beautiful door. cigar. Well, I mean, this was, this was an amazing you know, to me, story, this cigar, because it was the first time that a regional edition had ever been made in El Laguito factory, mm. ever, because it traditionally only makes very specific products and brands. And, and the reason for that was so, was so sort of, it was so honest, the reason for that. It was because when we asked for the cigar, El Rey del Mundo is made in a specific factory outside mm -hmm. Havana. But they said, well, we don't have the experience of rolling this size of cigar. Nice the right. only rollers yeah. in Cuba that have the experience of rolling this size of cigar are the rollers in El Laguito. It needs to be made in El Laguito. So we <laughs> then, uh, which was brilliant. So we then had this lovely period of over two years of going backwards and forwards and meeting the factory director. They were so excited by the project because they'd never had a regional edition themselves. Mm. They knew about them. Because Cohiba never doesn't been... do regionals. No, yeah. no. There's very strict um, guidelines on which brands are appropriate and not appropriate for regional editions. Okay. And it shifts different years. And there's rules like now you have to leave five years between using a brand twice. Okay. So we couldn't do Ramon Leonis this year and Ramon Leonis next year. We'd have to wait five mm -hmm. years. Um, so you sort of, you know, you look at the brands that are available and then we look for a bit of history yeah. or a reason to connect it. Um, but this El Rey del Mundo had a history of producing long, fine cigars, but it was a, um, it was a hell of a gamble, this cigar, <laughs> I have to say. Well, and the Lanceros, at that time, wasn't a popular format. 
if you if you'd gone out to most of the retailers and said what shall we what shall we make they would have said please can we have um, a, a 55 ring gauge it needs yeah. to be fat it needs to be long it needs to be in a pack of 10 so that we can you know sell them around the country mm -hmm. it needs to be in this brand and we had all the options on the table and I can almost remember the moment we were down to two and we like, come on come on let's do it yeah. what, what's the worst that can happen yeah. is that Edward Saharkin and I end up with <laughs> Yeah, 80,000 cigars that we yeah. have to smoke for the rest of our <laughs> lives because he and I are both enormous fans of this shape and size. Yeah. And, you know, to, be, to give them all the credit they're due, they're very, very good cigars. Oh, they're, they're, going, they're going through interesting phases yeah. and the blend is very curious because, well, I can't talk too much about the blend, but it's an unusual blend. So we're very interested to see how this cigar ages. Do you think it'll time. age well? I'd be really upset if it didn't. Did, yeah. um, and I have enough faith in the team that made this cigar to believe that they know enough about what they're doing, that the tobaccos that they used yeah. will age well. And it's, it's hard to see how this wouldn't age yeah. well. And apart from anything, I don't know what your experience has been, but on the whole, I would say that I've, I don't think I've had a plugged La no, Reina. I don't think I've had a problem with them. No. Um, and that comes down to the fact that they used grade nine plus rollers. So the cigar rollers are graded in Cuba mm -hmm. by, by skill, essentially, and experience. And so different categories of cigars are given to different roller grades. And this is considered one of the most difficult cigars to make. And therefore, the top team will always make a cigar of this size. And I think that's another reason why I like the Lanceros and the Fondadoris, mm -hmm. um, because you know the top yeah, teams made them. Absolutely. Um, that is one of the most elegant cigars. Um, I've got two and a half boxes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I twisted some arms with Edward. <clears throat> I said, Edward, you've got to sell me another box. These, I couldn't stop myself from smoking through the first I one. Know. They're very But I wanted to hold on to some. I know to experience the aging. Well, in about 15 so, years, we'll, we'll release some more yes. of this. You know, it'll be well, interesting. So, I mean, if, if, if you would allow me, I would love to try the Cohiba Lancer. Please do. Well, I will join you in that then, <laughs> um, because I think it's nicer that we both You know, these regionals, I love it so much because it helps really feed the collectability yes. and the enthusiast culture behind the Cuban cigars, because there's always something new and interesting with a story yes. to oh. experience. I mean, you couldn't ever grow tired no. of smoking Cuban cigars. No, and I, and I think that's been, you know, for, for me having gone through the process with the regionals from the beginning, I've learned more from sitting in rooms thinking and talking about what regional we might do than I have done otherwise. Because you do, you start delving into the history, you look at old bands, you look mm -hmm. at, sizes in those portfolios and did they exist and you 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 look to create a story but you look to create a story that is rooted in history, in that's, history. that's more or less always been our principle story. an yeah. authentic story yeah. um, and you know the Paul Araniaga Magnifico which was I think 2007 regional edition was an extraordinary experience because Simon Chase who was had been talking about Paul Araniaga, because Simon talked to everybody about cigars at every opportunity. And the doctor said, oh, well, funny enough, I've got, a, I've got a few of those somewhere and rattled around and found this box of cigars called Paul Araniaga Magnums, which <laughs> was a discontinued line. Good choice of doctor. And he gave Simon these cigars. We were going, you know, fast forward nine months later to sample the first Magnificos in the factory in Cuba where they were being produced. And there was a master blender there called Vichot, and Vishot is still alive, and he's done a lot of our blends for our regional editions. And we went to the factory, they'd made the first production of the Magnificos, which meant about 25 cigars. And Vishot was in the room, and Vishot's amazing for two reasons. One, he's been in the business, in the industry for decades. Two, he doesn't smoke. So he does everything by smell and feel. Really? And he doesn't write anything down. So he has in his mind a memory of blending cigars in the past. So he blended the Magnifico 
having blended the magnum 40, 50 years before, but not made them in between. So we got to sit there with magnums and magnificos and smoke them side by side, and they were the same cigar. I mean, with age on, absolutely. But the blend was spot on. And that's one of those moments when you think, this industry. It's astounding. It's phenomenal. I mean, it, it, it's beyond magic. It's, it's completely extraordinary. Yeah. So, well. regional editions. Well, there's a thing. But I sort of chop it off and light it. I mean, <laughs> I, I, <laughs> it's no ceremony to it. Well, I, I think, I think one of the, I think one of the hurdles for maybe my generation and particularly women is the idea that they don't understand the ceremony, that they're going to get that wrong. And so I've often, when I've done events or evenings or spoken to new smokers, I almost take it in the other direction and say, worry about the ceremony later. Mm. The only thing not, you know, there are two rules to me about, about starting a cigar. One is make sure you cut above the line, the mm -hmm. cap. And on any cigar, you will always be able to see that line. Yeah. And I would always suggest to people when the light's not good, make sure you can see that line because there's nothing worse. If you cut below it, it's holding the cigar together. So that's when your cigar unravels. And that's just a great, great pity. So look for the line. So cut above. Above the doesn't line. doesn't matter where yeah. above because you can always do it again. But always cut above the line. So don't cut too far into the cigar. No. Yeah. Can you see the little yeah, hat? Yeah, I see it, yeah. yeah. So that's yeah. the last bit that goes on the cigar, and it's mm -hmm. the only time that the cigar roller uses anything except pure tobacco. They have a little pad with gum, tree gum. So they cut out a piece of tobacco that's almost tear-shaped mm -hmm. with their chivetta, and that goes on. And on a, on a Cohiba and a Trinidad, it has a twisted cap. So there's that, cut it in the right place. And I think the second thing is just to relax about the lighting process mm -hmm. because the lighting processes can be really stressful you know particularly if you've got lots of hands involved and spills and flamethrowers and jet <laughs> fires and everything else I always say to, to people who are starting don't worry too much about it try and get it evenly lit and try to think of it almost like a like a very you don't want to burn it. Mm -hmm. I mean, you are, you're going to burn your cigar, but you don't yeah. want to burn it. You just want to get it warmed lit. up first yeah. of all, and then lit as evenly as you can. But at the end of the day, if you light one side a bit more than the other, the world's not going to stop. Yeah. The cigar's still going to be great. It you can could, even you out could recover it. It evens yeah. out. Yeah. 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 Well, please, I mean. <laughs> Demonstrate what I'm talking <laughs> about. <now. laughs> um, yeah. I mean, I, I don't know, what, what, what cutter do you prefer? Do Just you have a, a preference? Cut, yeah. yeah, me too. Um, I don't get all fussy about V cuts and punch cuts and... No, no, no. Um, there we go. Yeah, thank you. Well, I think this is our first cigar together, so what... What an honor. Thank you for having well, me. Well, I mean, lucky me, really. <laughs> You're too kind. Ah, there we go. Look at that. Perfect. And this is such a good... Uh, I mean, what, what is your favorite sort of size of cigar in you terms know, of ring? I have Are to you say, I started out smoking a lot of double Coronas, yeah. larger cigars. Yeah. Now that I've got a proper smoke filtration system and can smoke more during the day, I've kind of swung back towards Robustos and Coronas. Yeah. But the Lancero is, to this day, probably my favorite of all the formats. There's just a profound elegance to long, thin cigar. And I love the way it rolls in one's uh, hand, you know, even like that. I love that feeling of it's just yeah. quietly sitting there, all elegant and, you know. Well, it feels good in the hand. It has feels a, good in the hand. has a great hand to it. Um, and there's just something really magnificent and regal about a cigar this, of this size. Well, can you imagine trying to roll that? You know, keeping it all in the right place at the right moment, maintaining the blend through, making sure the leaves are in the... I mean, to me, the, the idea of being able to do that without it... You know, Robusto is one thing, mm -hmm. but that's a whole nother yeah. league of skill. That's why you don't see very many. No, no, no. Because you need, you need a big wrapper 
and you need a very skilled yeah. cigar roller. And also, they're, they're frankly not as fashionable as a, as a fat cigar. Yeah. Um, I've failed to furnish you with a lighter, haven't I? <laughs> After you, thank you. Um, No one does this better than Edward. <laughs> well, he just, it, it's the look on his face, I think, because every time he does it, it's almost like Groundhog Day. You know, you can see that he's, he's, he's looking forward to seeing whether you're going to enjoy the cigar, I'm going to enjoy the cigar, he's going to enjoy the cigar. And I always think that's one of the, the great things about Cuban cigars, is they get, they get a bit of bad press about their inconsistency. But I, I look at it more as there's this incredible thrill every time you open a box of cigars and you choose the one you're going to smoke. And is that going to go into the category of unforgettable cigars again? You never quite know. And when it does, there's nothing like it. Yes. And when it doesn't, it's still very good. Yes, yeah. indeed. Yeah, this is amazing. So what year did you say this was from? 2000 and one, I think <coughs> this is. 2001 we imported it, mm. December. So it's 20 years old. I mean, the first thing mm. I always notice about the aged cigar is the creaminess. Yes. There's no, you know, all of the, I wouldn't call it harshness, but just that first couple of draws, it goes into a different place in your yeah. throat to a new cigar does. There's a mouth. delicacy to it. Yeah. 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 I liken it to... I once had an opportunity to smoke a, it was like a 1990s uh, Cuban Davidoff number oh, one so with, with Edward and Eddie. Yeah. And you know, the difference between that cigar and a younger one was to me just like the difference between a new champagne and a really old vintage champagne. Yeah. The yeastiness, the subtleties. Yeah, I agree. Um, and it still was quite a strong cigar. Yeah. Well, and that's where it's, you know, it's, it's a really interesting exercise to do. It's more than an exercise. It's, it's interesting to, you know, take a Lanceros that's 20 years old and smoke one that's two years old side by side, just as a sort of, you know, we'll do that with the masters of cigars, just so that you can really understand that the blend has been respected and the blend hasn't fundamentally changed, but it's mellowed and it's softened and yeah. those tobaccos have all sat together for 20 years slowly just chilling out <laughs> and they're better for it they really are I mean I think that uh, all Cuban cigars benefit from a little bit of age mm -hmm. even if it's just two or three years uh, but once you get into you know five eight ten years yeah. you really just see this incredible evolution yes of flavors yes that to me again is what makes collecting and aging Cuban cigars just so much fun. So thrilling. Yeah. And I think that's one of the, you know, it's one of the, I don't know if it's the word is challenges or changes that we've seen in the last 10 years or so, is that with, with, the, with the increase of new cigars coming through and Cuban cigars, you know, reservers and limited editions and regionals, we have much more often released cigars sooner than we would have done traditionally. Okay. So in the past, take a, I'd take a Monty 2. Mm -hmm. We probably hold two years of Monty 2 stock in the warehouse. And therefore, you're always releasing the oldest first. So probably in the market, most people wouldn't have smoked a Monte Cristo 2 that didn't have at least two or three years on it by the time it gets to yeah. the retailer. What's happened with the introduction of lots of new sizes and brands and things, which is brilliant, is that the cigars are released much earlier and therefore they're much fresher. So you're developing in the consumer a better understanding and quite often a taste for a fresher cigar. Mm -hmm. And I think the interesting thing there is to try and distinguish between fresh and strong. And again, it's, it's a bit like the conversation between strength and aroma. 
sometimes it can be very difficult to separate the two out. Um, but the, the fresh cigar is strong often. And I think that there's a lot of consumers out there that believe that the strong cigar is, is what they're looking for. I think what I'm trying to say is that the taste for fresh cigars run side by side with the taste for stronger cigars. People are sort of looking for higher strength cigars mm -hmm. all the time. And a cigar like this puts that into reverse for me. Because it's everything that a fresh cigar isn't. It's it a is. polar opposite. Yeah. But it know. still has the strength of nicotine. Yes. So it's not, you know, that hasn't aged out of the cigar. No, 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 no. So it still has its, uh, you know, robustness. It's still a robust cigar but it has a delicacy of flavor. And it will build yeah. over the course of smoking the cigar. It's another reason I love a Lancero. Again, you've got more evolution yeah. as you smoke through it. Yeah. And it's a much cooler smoke, right? Because it's had more time to cool as it filters through the cigar itself. Well, that's such a good point because the, the belief often, not always, but the belief often is that slimmer cigars are gonna be hotter. And actually, that's genuinely not my experience. Yeah. Um, it doesn't work like that mm -hmm. with the Cuban cigar. Yes, it works like that with a machine-made little, you know, cigarillos or something. That is a hotter cigar, but it doesn't work like that with fat and slim cigars in, in the handmade yeah. world. Um, and I always think that, you know, the Siglo 6 is one of my favorite cigars, and that is a huge surprise to me because on paper, the Siglo 6 is a large ring gauge, big cigar, in Cohiba, in the Siglo range, and yet for me it's one of the most gentle and delicious cigars yeah. you can find. So are you allowed to have favorites? I mean, do you have <laughs> any <laughs> favorites amongst the, the range? Trinidad. I mean, I'm a, I'm a huge fan of so Trinidad. So which of the Trinidads? What Fundadores. Oh, I, just, um, I just discovered or acquired a, a new box. No. Wow. We, like weeks before the announcement. Yes. My mother-in-law was in Mexico City and I had to bring a box back for me. Thank you, lucky man. <laughs> Look, we don't have a stick. Really? Literally yeah. not a cigar. And that's slightly heartbreaking. But the, the Fundador is, when it's good, is that I think it just beats everything. Yeah. Well, just like um, the Lanceros, yeah. but absent the Fundadores, where did you find a Lancera other than the Cohiba we're, we're smoking now. You don't, really. Yeah. You don't. And I think that's the, I think that's the fun <coughs> of it. Unless you find a nice cigar roller in Cuba who makes you a Lanceros. But even then, you don't. I mean, the El Rey del Mundo is the, is the closest thing we've had. Um, but there aren't any more in production. Really? Not really. Huh. No, no, because the world has gone to bigger and bigger cigars. Yeah. And that's quite a recent... You know, when you, when you look back through the history of the sizes of cigars, the Robusto sized cigar existed, you know, Epi 2s, D4s, but in tiny volumes. And it wasn't until Cohiba Robusto was launched in 89, and they used the word Robusto, which was normally the Vitola de Galera. So Robusto was always used as the size that if you were doing your Robusto size, five mm -hmm. and seven eighths, 50 ring gauge cigar, it, you, it was termed a Robusto in the factories. It had never been called a Robusto in public. So mm. Cohiba was the first brand to call that size the same Vitola de Salida, so the market yeah. name as the, as the factory name. And you know, I don't know what it was about that cigar, but within you know, a handful of years, Robustos became the best-selling cigars in, in the world. So what was best-selling before that? Monte Fours. Okay. Monte Fours Petty Corona size. You know, mm. that, was, that was really the most of the market. We sold, you know, cabinets of 50s and double Coronas and all those sorts of cigars, but you wouldn't have seen so many of those in, in a wide number of markets outside the UK. Yeah. And I, you know, Proper gentleman cigar. I mean, to me, <clears throat> the, the great tragedy is the decline of the cabinet of 50. Ugh. Cabinet of 50 makes everything better. I'm with you. 100%. I mean, cabinets in general, even if you can find a cabinet of 25. Yeah, I agree. In my opinion, is more desirable than a cabinet, than a box of 25. The challenge with a cabinet of 50 is trying to get them back in once you've taken them out, <laughs> without, the, you know, without everything collapsing. But 
there's something about the way they sit together within the cedar box. I think it's that, for me, it's got to be something to do with the fact that a little bit more air can circulate. Mm. There's, there's, you know, I think of them as almost pets. I think they like it, the cigars <laughs> being part of a cabinet of 50. Really? Yeah, yeah, I do. I think they, That's fascinating. they respond well to And you don't see very many cabinets anymore. There aren't many. Most of the, most of the brands <coughs> discontinue cabinets of 50 now, but that is entirely reflective of the world's demand. You know, mm. Cuba, like all of us, has got better at analysing data. And therefore, if people aren't asking for them, why Jim carry on making it? Jim, must ask for these. Well, we are, I mean, we're doing our best. But, but um, once they've discontinued something, it's quite hard to bring it back. I mean, yeah. we look at cabinets of 50 for things like regional editions. And I think we'll do one. But it's a, it's a, it's a big box of cigars, a cabinet yeah. of 50. Anything interesting in the works you can share? Hi, I'm Kirby Allison, and thank you for watching today's video. If you enjoy the content that we film here on this YouTube channel, one of the best ways that you can support our ability to film even more great content is by visiting kirbyallison.com, where you'll find the largest collection of luxury garment care, luxury shoe care, and other great clothing accessories for the well-dressed. Also, we have a Patreon page where 100% of the proceeds from our Patreon go to our ability to travel in pursuit of this quality, craftsmanship, and tradition. So if you love the content, these are two great ways to support what you see here on youtube.com slash Kirby Allison. Well, in the world. Without, um, you know, spoiling anything. <laughs> well, we had our... Um, 2020 was our 200, the year of our 230th anniversary, but we were firmly stuck in the world of COVID mm -hmm. then. Um, and the cigar that we requested um, was made for that anniversary under the regional edition program is called the Ramon Ionis Private Stock 230. Okay. And um, Ramon Ionis is a brand that Hunterson Frankau has a long history with. Um, it was owned by Frank Howe from 1911 to 1927 really? and the worldwide distribution rights went on yeah. and on beyond that so after we bought the Franco company and Ramon Ionis has always been a brand that I associate with hunters not not even only because of the history but because Simon and the previous chairman Mr Lewis would really smoke a lot of Ramon Ionis specially selected. Yeah. And as you know, the range of Ramon Ionis, I mean, it was an incredibly broad range in the 1900s, is now down to a handful of sizes. So it's always a nice brand to revive. And we had done the Ramon Ionis Anniversario 225 for our 225th anniversary. So we wanted to do... Got a box of those. That's a, I mean, that's an interesting cigar. Or should I say cabinet of 25? Have you smoked one recently? Uh, no, I'm, it's literally on my top shelf of my humidor, kind of behind. I can't see it, right? The idea being that if I can't see it, I won't be tempted to smoke it. <laughs> I mean, that, the, the evolution of that cigar has been a, an extraordinary thing to observe. But, uh, I, and I think it will carry on aging beautifully. But the private stock 230 is a, is a larger cigar, so it's a Particus 16. So wow. it's a, it, it'll be a... Bigger cigar, and we've done a private stock is a name that was used in the Ramon Ionis brand okay. in the past. Um, and we've gone back to the Ramon Ionis green and white cigar band. Mm. So we're doing a first tasting of that in May. There's a trade, big trade show. All the specialists will be there. In Cuba? So, no, in London. In oh, London. It's not in London, actually. It's outside <coughs> London. But we've, um, we've got the first prototypes to mm. smoke then and we're looking to launch that in September. So that for us is very exciting. Is exciting. And we're, we're just finalizing a humidor. Within the aged and rare program, um, the umbrella of that is called House Reserve. Mm -hmm. So we don't only release the cigars in boxes, we're looking at every year making a special collection from our reserve cigars. So this year, or well, it was meant for 2020, but you know, it's all blurred into one now. <laughs> um, we're doing a Ramon Ionis humidor, which will have 61 cigars in it. And it's got all of the Ramon Ionis regionals, including the Ramon Ionis Petit Bellicose, which was the prototype regional that huh. doesn't even have the second band on it because we were the test market for really? regionals. So one of those, and then 
10 or 25 of others. So we're doing the Ramon Onis collection. And the first release of the 230 will be part of that the humidor. The problem is you do that, in, it becomes a priceless humidor of cigars. I couldn't possibly imagine how someone would actually smoke from that. Well, no, and we're, we've actually done a foot band so that it, it, this time you can't break the collection up and you know, slot another cigar in, because I, I, I like you, I think that putting them together is part of the, part yeah. of the joy. And, and also we have the huge privilege of the provenance. You know, the, these cigars have been nowhere bar, yeah. factory, yeah. Cuba warehouse, our warehouse. So the, the, the journey is so much smaller than a lot of boxes of cigars, which do get moved around a lot. And, and I, I like that, that, you know, we can trace them. You really do trade you. in romance and magic. <laughs> I'm not so lucky. I mean, really, it's a... Um, I love what I do, but I love what you do even more. <laughs> well, it's, it's, um, it's never, ever dull. That's the truth of it. I mean, there are, there are never, ever a dull moment in this business. And it, it, it keeps evolving. That's what's so fascinating about yeah. it, is you think you're going into a lull, and then it all changes again. Well, it's really, I mean, it's just so dynamic. Yeah. For something that has been around for as long as it is. Yeah. And I feel like in America, you know, unfortunately we don't have access to Cuban cigars. So there is very little familiarity with the Cuban cigar culture. Yes. And so people's orientation towards cigars in America is fundamentally different. And I think that does no justice to Cuban cigars and just the history, the magic uh, and the stories is, uh, couldn't be any more different. Do you think that's shifting in America? Uh, I mean, I think that you have uh, certainly uh, more interest in in uh, New World cigars. Yeah. Um, I think that, you know, I'd like to think it's a growing market. I mean, I see it is. the interest certainly uh, amongst the people that we, that subscribe to our channel, yeah. right? Um, but I think that the collectability and the magic mm. is just not there with the New World because they don't, I just don't see the same degree of embellishing the special, the rare, and the unique, mm. the same way that you have with no. Cuban tobacco. Well, and also you can't, just by the nature of how the New World cigars evolved, the history is still young. relatively young. young. Um, but I mean, I think that there, there's... I mean, barely 30 years. Yeah. Barely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, what Davidoff did in the uh, 1990s, I mean, there, there was no growing of premium uh, cigars in the Dominican. I, I, was, I mean, I was reading the, the story of Schneider the other day. I mean, the, the, the way that he pioneered that. Truly visionary. Yeah, I agree. And, and after, a, after a loss, like losing your ability to produce those brands in Cuba, yes. to pick yourself back up Ugh. and say, on we go. I mean, and that, that sort of sums up the cigar business to yeah. me, because everybody has to quite often pick themselves up and say, how do we solve this problem? I and mean, we have here, like most markets, you know, an endless onslaught of new legislation coming through. Smoking ban, display ban, we can't advertise, we have to put warnings. It goes on and on and on. And every time something comes along and you look at it in writing and you think that's the end. <laughs> and, then, and then the little gray cells go and you think, well, does it have to be the end if we, you know. Yeah. And it's not about breaking the law, it's about finding a way of making the cigars relevant and accessible to people who still want them. Yeah. So, I mean, kind of to that end, but one of the things that I, I appreciate, though, is that Cuban cigars aren't just something for the ultra-wealthy. I mean, in this country, and in America especially, I, used, I mean, uh, Edward Sahakian speaks of the taxi cab driver coming in. Uh, and then you've got, you know, the prime minister uh, of some country coming in right after him. And one of the things I love about the Sahakians, of course, is they're all treated the same cool. in his shop. Yeah. Um, I mean, he is a cigar merchant par excellence. Yeah. Um, although it could be perceived as something being very elite, it really couldn't be anything farther from that. Whenever you're in the company of a cigar 
someone that appreciates cigars, the generosity, the friendship, yeah. the conversation, yeah. uh, just cuts across I completely agree. the entire, uh, all, any divide, yeah, all agree. of them. I agree not with just you. Social, not, so, yeah. not just social classes, but you know, every, every difference, in, difference of opinion uh, just kind of falls down mm. in the company of a great cigar. And, and, you know, you're absolutely right. My, my experience, I mean, yes, you have a city like London where you have a huge amount of wealth. So you have the collectors and the wonderful private members clubs and you have all of that and it's phenomenal and it is incredibly important to our industry. But we mustn't forget that outside a city like London is 80% of our market in this country. Mm, wow. and, and a lot of those areas are not wealthy areas. Yeah. And yes, you might not buy a whole box of cigars, mm. but you might buy one cigar, and yeah. on a Saturday you smoke one cigar. I mean, when we look at consumption of cigars, and we have very little data, I remember 10 years ago, the, the terminology for an industrial smoker was someone who smoked one cigar a week. <laughs> I mean, that's an amazing, yeah. you know, that they're, they're not smoked that often, that they need to be elitist. Yeah. That to me is the whole point, is, you choose your moment, you choose your time, you choose your company. Yeah. And to be honest, yes, there are cigars that cost hundreds of pounds, but when you look at the comparative price now of, say, a steak yeah. in a decent restaurant, yes. or, a, or, a, or a nice bottle of wine, mm -hmm. not a silly bottle of wine, a nice bottle mm -hmm. of wine, or you go to a, a, a hotel and you ask for a gin and tonic now, it isn't much less than a, than a small cigar. And the difference to me in what's gone into making one versus making the other, I, I, I almost think you can't put a price no. on cigars. And I, and I feel it's probably inappropriate for me to say that as someone who's commercially involved. Yeah. But I, I, you know, it's, it's difficult to, yeah. to put a number on a cigar. Well, I mean, our channel, of course, is all about quality, mm. craftsmanship, and tradition. Mm. And I can't think of anything that better represents those three qualities than a fine Cuban cigar. There's nothing more widely consumed that is handmade, that has the work and the provenance that goes into it yeah. than a Cuban cigar. Yeah. Handmade, the yeah. amount of work, like what you said, that goes yeah. in to growing the tobacco, to rolling the cigars, yeah. to aging them, yeah. and then getting them here. And in, a, in an environment that's incredibly challenging, for all the reasons, well, legislatively, but if you if you take a country like Cuba, where it isn't flowing with resources, it isn't flowing with in infrastructure, it isn't flowing with machinery that supports this industry, it is very much done in the way it's always been done, and and it's done incredibly well, and mm -hmm. and the difficulty involved in growing tobacco climate will there be a tornado did the fertilizer turn up because did the vehicle have petrol to bring the fertilizer did the i mean if you were to sit down and try and write down all the things that could go wrong you'd go insane because it's a miracle i think that that the production is ever completed yeah. and you know i i also feel that you know cuba's had a particularly hard couple of years mm. as has the whole world and we have definitely seen that difficulty come through in supply issues, but we should also recognize how many cigars Cuba has continued to make, to make. In, in an almost impossible environment. Yeah. And, and compared to some of the products we're trying to order as a business, they're, they're yeah. heads above. Yeah, you know, I, I joke that the, um, but I think it's true, which is that you know, the world would be a much more peaceful place if diplomacy was still done over a cigar. <laughs> of course. <Yes. laughs> and, and I suspect quite a lot of it is yeah. quietly and not publicly done over a cigar. Um, but, but I think that, you know, it definitely tones down any situation to mm -hmm. a good place. Mm, yeah. Do you think that, um, pivoting back to kind of Hunters and Francao, do you think the fact that you guys have had you know, the exclusivity of importing Cuban cigars. Do you think that's helped you better manage and cultivate the cigar culture 
and market here in the United Kingdom than if it was fragmented? I mean, it's a really good question because you guys have ex exercised such tremendous leadership in really building and growing it here. And, and you know, that's very kind of you to say, but we are sitting at the moment in a market that is very strong and, and against all the odds, honestly. It, it, it is, you know, it could have gone either direction. Yeah. But I think it's a really interesting question because obviously in the, in the past, different companies had different brands yeah. and you, you would be going into Davidoff with your briefcase and I've still got one of those wonderful <laughs> briefcases that cigar sellers used to have. Really? They'd open up, double, like a wooden briefcase and you'd have the whole Hoyo range behind a sort of, not plastic, but behind a sheet. And, and that's what they walked around with, like a gun case almost, yeah. you'd open it up, there's one uh, it, um, somewhere. You know, you'd be in, followed by me, followed by the next person. I think what we have been sensitive to is that essentially, if people want Cuban cigars, we're the place that they need to come to because yeah. we're the official distributor. And I think there's a balance that one tries to tread between providing something in addition to that because essentially people have no real option so you, you could you could in one way behave any way you wish to behave mm -hmm. in the face of that and I think that we've always tried and we, we have a sort of when we train a new area manager we always say to them sell in much less than you think you need to because the one thing that we don't want to happen is that someone comes back and says I couldn't sell these yeah you want your next call with a customer mm -hmm. to be, I need more of these. And therefore you take a very gentle approach with customers yeah. and you build slowly as they build, this is new customers, as they build their confidence, you go from a range of three to four to five to six. You layer in training so that their staff are beginning to understand cigars. You add in the odd event. You, you make sure that what you're building is a, is a world that they feel part of, yeah. like a community. Mm -hmm. and, and I think in that way, it's good not to have the competition. Yeah. But, you know, that's not to say that, that there isn't competition out there. Yeah. I mean, you know, the New World cigars have, have always traditionally had, I don't know, 10 to 15 percent of the market. Yeah. And, and that's a busy corner of the market. You know, I, I don't take it for granted that Cuban cigars will dominate this market forever. Yeah. I mean, if we sat down and did nothing. Yeah. Which, which, you know? which you have, never have. No, we I can't. Mean, yeah. No, and I, and I love that. I mean, it's part of, part of the joy of this business is you're, you know, you're, you're buying and selling a product, but you're also buying and selling something that people feel so strongly about. So you have a responsibility to make people feel good about that choice. Yeah. And I, I love, or we all love here, the process of making the humidor, or the collection, or what would look nice in a the box. Regionals. The re I mean, the regionals is a choice. I mean, just being able to pull from your private reserve, like, I, know. I mean, we have to talk about this for a second, Rich. <laughs> Before we got started, I was speaking that the Bolivar Corona Gigante, you know, was one of my favorite yeah. uh, cigars that uh, sadly is no longer produced. Right, and I've got, I think, half of one box left set aside, you know, for only the most special of occasions, right? And, you know, here you are with this firm's incredible history and incredible stock mm -hmm. to still be able to, you know, slowly and in small quantities, you know, pull from that. But and it's release. quite painful as well. <laughs> I bet it I is. mean, I suspect that we have around six of those and we probably put two into last year's house reserve and and it's something that i really struggle with and and have to be talked down on quite a lot because i don't i don't i don't i don't love letting them go yeah. i mean and, and edward and i i mean eddie's always teasing edward about his <laughs> his, his, reserve. his reserve and i have absolutely every sympathy possible for Edward <laughs> because i feel slightly the same they're not mine once they're gone they're gone they're gone. And where are they going to go? You know, it's, it's like, it's like um, you know, Raiders of the Lost Ark. Do you remember when Harrison Ford spends the whole year trying to find the Ark and then it just goes into a, into a big warehouse with 4,000 others? <laughs> I mean, to me, the best place a box of cigars can almost go is, is to your shelf where you look at it every day and think, is this a Bolivar Corona Gigante's day? Maybe. No, maybe it'll be Saturday. You know, that, that 
anticipation and knowing what you've got and when you might choose the right moment is perfect. Do you want to see them collected or smoked? Both. Because I think, I think that the smoking is absolutely key. Because what's the point of making something and never consuming it? Yeah. A bit like wine. You know, you, you look in your wine cellar in the evening and sometimes you go, God, let's just have a really great bottle tonight. And that's a pleasure in that yeah. moment, on that evening. Yes, in 10 years, it might have been worth twice as much or three times as much. But I think if you think like that, you're, I understand thinking like that, but I also think you're not living in the moment. And sometimes you just got to live in the moment, whether it's the best or the, yeah. it doesn't matter. And on the other hand, I'm incredibly grateful to people who do collect because they're preserving history. Yeah. And the ones that do it well and look after the cigars properly yeah. are doing a great service to us yeah. because they come round again. They do, yeah. You know, they appear. And we filmed a video with uh, Edward and Eddie. This was during lockdown, so it was remotely. And our film crew had the privilege of actually being there. I was behind a computer. I think it was like 6 a.m. in Texas or something when we were filming this. Uh, but Edward very generously brought out his humidors, mm. right, that he's collected over the years. And just the history yeah. behind those is yeah. profound. I mean, the humidors that he has as a part of his, the proper humidors, right, yes. the, the special ones. Yes, the collection. Uh, I couldn't ever imagine touching. Those only deserve, yeah. I mean, to be in a museum yeah. and preserved to preserve the history. Well, I mean, I think there's a call for that. Yeah. I, I think it would be a really interesting thing to do is to, you know, and, and we're thinking about as part of the work we're doing in this building, is how can we, how can we display, display yeah. something that isn't everything? Because yeah. you can build a big walk-in humidor and put thousands of boxes of cigars in, and that's lovely. But these individual little pieces of history, and you know, over there we've got the safe from the Upman factory, from <laughs> when we used to own the Upman factory. That's a, that's a little piece of history yeah. sitting there. And the, and the cigars over there from the 1880s from La Corona factory. I mean, at that time, all cigars were double figurado. So that yeah. piece of history is so interesting because it shows you that is how all cigars were made. The, the Parejo, the parallel sided mm. cigar came much later. The world needs both. We need I mean, both. I couldn't imagine we need it would be, uh, I don't know, so against my nature to buy a beautiful box with the idea of never smoking it, right? I think holding on to it increases its meaning yeah. so that whenever you do choose to smoke that, whether it be to celebrate a, or commemorate a special occasion yeah. uh, or uh, to enjoy it in the company of someone special to you, it only enhances it Absolutely. even further. I mean, when, when um after my father... Like this beautiful cigar. Well, this is a great cigar. Yeah, I mean, this you. is a good cigar. After my father died in 2000, and I would go back to... Started going to Cuba probably a couple of years later, I knew that he had kept some cigars in some of the shops in Cuba. Um, and luckily, Simon Chase remembered where some of them were. And other <laughs> he had a great memory, Simon. He had a, I mean, thank <coughs> God, he had a brilliant memory. He was a historian. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he, was a, he was a brilliant man. Um, but... I would go into, whether it was the Particus factory or Fifth Avenue, and there would be these boxes of cigars, and on the back of them, he would have written the date and the initials of who he was with and how many cigars they took out. So it was like a sort of catalogue of years yes. in Cuba. And, and up, up until I needed to take them out of Cuba, I kept doing the same thing. So you'd see, you know, 1989, yeah. NF and ES, yeah. which meant Nick, Daddy and Edward had gone in yeah. and smoked a... Siglo two together, but there was just this story on the box, and yeah. I really like that yeah. writing down the initials and That's the date. Great, yeah, I'm going to pick that up. Well, and the other thing is, how do you remember who <coughs> gave you what cigar? Yeah. Because, as you know, the, the you know one of the great things about cigars is you can carry them around so easily. It's not like putting two bottles of wine in your pocket and I give you one and say you should try this. Cigar smokers are endlessly trading, yeah. sharing, sharing. Yeah. Yes, because they found a good cigar and they want someone else to have that. And I really struggle if I'm not going to smoke that cigar with how do I remember who gave me this on which day and maybe why or what it was because sometimes you get a cigar it hasn't got a band on it. Mm -hmm. It's very old. Someone says this is an old X and I got it from so-and-so 
I've started sort of tagging them with those little, yeah. you know, s string with a little piece of card on uh, and writing a tag on it, a like, a, like a dead body, you know, they do yeah. with a toe. I have some, one of my special cigars in my humidor is the uh, Cuaba Diademas. Mm. This, they come in the individual coffins. They're super large. I don't even know if you can find these anymore. No. I think I have three of them left because it only came in a box of five. Yeah. Right? Because they were each. Take up so much space in yes. coffins. Yeah. And so I think it was, you know, I'm on my last box. I had another one I smoked through. And I would inevitably find myself holding them for Christmas at my dad's house yeah. or Thanksgiving. Yeah. Right? Because I knew I had a long afternoon. I could enjoy this very large format cigar. Yeah. And I, I've taken to saving the coffins and writing on them the date and Perfect. where I smoked it. Because one day I want to look back and, you know, I mean, it, as Edward says, we're collecting memories. Mm. You know, every single time you smoke a cigar. Well, your children will. Yeah. I mean, you know, like I did and, and got a kind of brief sense of that moment that you weren't part of, you know, because your children will grow up knowing that you love cigars and they will inherit a sense of that. An appreciation. Of course. One hopes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, y you can't not inherit a sense of the appreciation because people that smoke cigars tend to appreciate their lives in general. My experience has yeah. often been, you know, that, that they are grateful for those moments, however many or few there might be, and, and therefore that bleeds out into the rest of their lives. You know, they like their food, they like going to nice restaurants or not nice restaurants, but just life is, is interesting. Relationships. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I could I ask you to speak a bit about your father and what it was like, you know, growing oh. up with someone who, again, had this profound passion and appreciation for this craft. Well, he, I mean, we, we grew up in a, in a house that was he was a very he was a very sociable man and he liked people and and i think i you know really remember as a, as a as a child and a teenager that there would be a certain routine to the evenings wherever we were you know it would be the lights would go on in the drawing room and the ice bucket would come up onto the bar and then my father would get home and and he'd go and have a bath or something and he'd go into the drawing room and then he'd find a cigar and then the door would go and somebody would arrive and probably somebody else would arrive and maybe somebody else would arrive and my mother and that was that was our world and there would always be people around Sunday lunch out at restaurants everywhere and I think what he loved about cigars is one of the things I loved about love about it is you just meet endless people who you would like to spend your time yes. with and he, you know, he, he was very, he, he, he came into the business at an interesting time. I mean, my grandfather had sold the family business to Gallagher's in the 50s. And the family business was manufacturing cigars originally. So my great, great, great grandfather, James, was married to a Dutch lady who taught him how to make cigars. They lived in Hoxton in London, huh. which is, you know, East London. They lived yeah. above a shop. And he and his wife would roll cigars, and that became a bigger and bigger business. And eventually they moved out of London to Cardiff, and, and they became the second biggest manufacturer of cigars in England. You know, 70 odd million cigars were produced, yeah. li mainly little cigars. And so there was always the, the history of tobacco making was always in the family, but not, you know, our history with Cuba didn't really start till the 1920s when we bought the Franco business, hence Hunters and Franco and they owned the H. Upman factory. Mm -hmm. So we, we became custodians of yeah. that for a while. And it was my great grandfather that sold the factory back to the Menendezes um, after 12 hours in a bar <laughs> and disappearing for a week and, and everything <coughs> else that went on. Um, so we'd had this long history in the cigar business and the long history in Cuba. And I think for my father, Part of the excitement was when he was first in the business, there were other companies involved in selling cigars in the market. And he was the one that really consolidated everything and you know, absorbed the other distributors when they became distressed. Yeah. And so we ended up really with the family business 
owning the distribution for most of the brands. Mm -hmm. And then after that, Cube were appointed us. And, and we sort of grew up, grew up knowing that cigars were part of life, but we didn't really talk about business at home. Yeah. It, wasn't, it, wasn't, it wasn't discussed. And my father, I don't think, well, I know, hadn't planned for me to go into the business. It was, it was planned for my brother to go into the business mm -hmm. in a traditional English family. Um, and actually the, the family business has always stayed, you know, it's always been passed from one generation to the other, but it hasn't kind of gone out into lots of cousins and nephews. And I think that's one of the reasons the business has always been through the eldest. Um, it's always, it's, it's been a, as a consequence of small families. So my mm -hmm. father was one of two children okay. and his brother had Down syndrome. So it was obviously naturally went to my father, mm -hmm. but the generation above my father, so my grandfather had two brothers who were involved, but he bought them out. So it was always kept quite mm -hmm. linear, I suppose. Um, and I think that's when you see often see problems in family businesses when yeah. by five generations, you've got 93 yeah. cousins that all have different know, agendas. Piece of the brand. Yeah. Whereas we've ended up, you know, it's yeah. just, it's just the family now really. Um, and my, my father and I used to talk a lot about, I, I suppose about business and life, mm -hmm. but not specific to the cigar business. Yeah. Um, he was, he was a, he was a, he was a sort of, absolutely met the definition of an entrepreneur. He was always thinking about the next idea. Mm. What was next? You know, he, he was constantly inventing things. So business was one part of his life, but the other part of his life was sitting with people, getting new ideas. He'd come, come away from every evening going, right, I've got it, I've got the next big thing is going to be boil in the bag food, or it's going to be this, or it's going to be that, and off he go, huh. you know. And, and it makes him sound much more eccentric than he was. He was actually, he had a lot of foresight. I mean, he, he owned one of the first shops in London that sold computer games, and, yeah. it, and it went bust because nobody was ready. Everyone sort of, nobody wants computer games, what a waste of time. So he was sort of, you know, ahead two of his time, in that, ahead way. Of his time yeah. in that way. And I think what, what, he, what he created here was a brilliant team around him. And, and, you know, a lot of them are still here. Yeah. And, you know, we've lost Simon on the way, which is, you know, no words for that, and David Baxter, who was the managing director for many years, and and but there is the continuity. You know, it does keep going on. Philip, who's the finance director, has been here, you know, a long time. I mean, lots of people. Hmm. One of the things I love so much about Britain, and you see this in London, I think it makes it such a unique place in the world, is the existence of these multi-generational heritage brands mm -hmm. that are still controlled and very tightly controlled by the family. Mm. And it allows them to really operate truly as custodians of that history versus, That's it. Uh, you know, versus just profit maximizing That's it. You know, business owners. Yeah. We were at Flores earlier today, I think it's on the eighth generation. I mean, they've been on German Street in the same shop since the 18th century. And that's a difficult thing yeah. to do. You know, business schools are full of case studies yes. on family businesses that have gone wrong. Yeah. You know, to get to eight generations is phenomenal. Yeah. And to still have a product like Floris mm -hmm. that is so true to itself. Yeah. I, I mean, that, that, that is astounding. Yeah. Had an opportunity to create a bespoke fragrance, which uh, I don't know if you may have done this already with them. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if you, if you had. Uh, but, you know, to be able to go through that with brand like Floris that's been around that long, or to go to John Lobb, have them make a pair of shoes the same way that they've been made, you know, since, you know, King Edward, you know, in the mid 19th century, yeah. uh, or, you know, Huntsman, or Henry Poole. Yeah. Um, Henry Poole, of course, Simon Cundy being another great example along the lines of, of your family and the Bodenhams, you know, again, I mean, they have that the company has been controlled by a family member, yeah. you know, since its inception yeah. and the way that they've been able to just preserve the craft yeah. and the heritage, you know, still run a business and be profitable and make money because you have to yeah. in order to stay in business, yeah. uh, but to do so in such a way that doesn't sell, sell out or in any way compromise uh, the, uh, the integrity of that brand. The other thing that these sorts of businesses have got very good at is they've, 
they've learned to lift the veil a little bit on what they do. And that is so exciting. Yeah. You know, to, uh, we talk a lot about Cuban cigars and the mystique of them. And part of that mystique is their history yeah. and the processes. But even when, we, even when we get to see a little bit of that, we're left as mystified <coughs> as ever. You know, you see yeah. a bit and you think, oh, OK, I, maybe I get how they do that, maybe. Well, I'm not <laughs> sure. And you realise that's one part of yeah. my... And I imagine it's the same as making a pair of shoes or yeah. a suit. You know, the, the yeah. process, the work, the... Well, Lob, Lob allowed us in. I mean, I think we were the first film crew they allowed in since, like, the BBC in the 90s. Um, yes. <laughs> and there was a certain degree of, uh, I don't want to call it discomfort, but... Uh, I mean, they, they slightly didn't really know what to do in front of a video camera. Um, but in the end, we produced this absolutely marvelous piece yeah. that captured the essence of Lob yeah. and why one would go out of their way mm. to spend an extraordinary amount of money and time, because mm. it just doesn't happen overnight, uh, to commission and then own a pair of shoes. Yeah. And then just like with cigars, I mean, a shoe is slightly more durable but it's meant to be worn and enjoyed, yes, yes. not just hung on a wall no. and admired. And also, I think with somebody like Lob, you make a really interesting point, I, and correct, please correct me if I'm wrong. In the past, you would have bought Lob because your father bought Lob, and therefore you bought Lob. You wouldn't give it a great deal of thought. You had your shoe mold, you bought your shoes. Yes. This generation are much more curious about the whys and the wherefores, yeah. and, and I think that one of the challenges we have is to share the information mm. and maintain the integrity at the same time. Because it's not, it's not always, the two don't always go hand in hand. Yeah. You give too much away and the, 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 the thrill is taken. But with products like shoes and suits and cigars, I think you can go on talking about how it's yeah. done endlessly because there's nothing to hide in there there's no shortcuts yeah, no. there's no easy solution there's millions of challenges and problems along the way yeah. and nothing can be speeded up mm -hmm. incredible i mean the way that this has evolved i i feel a little bit rude and not allowing you to smoke more of that because i've been uh, <laughs> monopolizing <laughs> this great conversation <laughs> talk endlessly yeah no, but it is I, nice actually and it's sort of that, that first creaminess has, has gone, but the quality of the smoke is almost silken. It's, it's really, there's a lot of smoke on this cigar. There's there a lot of tobacco in here. Yeah. You know, I'm not one, I feel like my olfactory is slightly uh, imbued in that, uh, you know, I'm not one to really pick up on nuanced flavors like, mm -mm. you know, Nick, the great Nick Falks might be able to, or uh, any of the Sahakians. But one of the things that I, I do feel that I, I am able to pick up on, and one of the things that led me to what I'm doing, is just texture. Yeah. And this has, you know, uh, you can feel the difference in the quality of smoke between a cigar like this and a different cigar. Totally agree. Last night I was smoking uh, something in the evening time, uh, and it just had a kind of a roughness mm -hmm. to it mm -hmm. that this doesn't have. I mean, this is as smooth as silk, it's creamy, uh, it's uh, got just incredible texture. And it's very satisfying. I think, again, with a slim cigar, one expects it to be less satisfying than a big cigar, but I find that entirely, you know, it, 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 it's, as, it's, as, it's as enjoyable as a 54 or 55 ring gauge. So what's next? I mean, again, I think that, um, you know, Gemma, you've done and your family, your father, your grandfather, of course, um, has done such an incredible job developing the enthusiast culture and the connoisseurship and the appreciation, which is at the end of the day what all of that is about, of cigars. So, you know, what is it that kind of over the last few years that you look back on with particular pride? 
Hi, I'm Kirby Allison, and thank you for watching today's video. If you enjoy the content that we film here on this YouTube channel, one of the best ways you can support us is by joining our Patreon page. 100% of the proceeds from our Patreon go to support our ability to travel in pursuit of quality, craftsmanship, and tradition. So if you love the content that we film with independent artisans, take a moment and visit our Patreon page. We have several different membership levels that give you access to exclusive content and discounts on KirbyAllison.com, as well as many other great benefits. So if you love this content and want to be a member of this community, take a look at Patreon.com slash KirbyAllison. I think there are, there are, there are two areas that, that we have, well, I look back on with great pride, and I think one is to do with training. We have always felt that we have to equip people who are selling cigars with as much information as possible. Mm -hmm. And as we all know, in the last 10, 15 years, the volume of information available through the internet yeah. is colossal. Mm -hmm. And so everybody's an expert. Yeah. And, and therefore, we have to stay one step ahead of that, not only as a business, but the people we're asking to present cigars to experts need to be one step ahead. And that was part of the thinking behind the master's program, okay. is we wanted a new level to set that people working in the cigar industry could try to attain this level and it would set them apart from everybody else. And it was interesting because we, we set it up as a, as a almost like a little mini diploma. So it's more, our traditional training has been passive. We can do two hours, we can do a day, we have various different formats. With this one, we would almost say to somebody, how, how much do you want to know about cigars? And they would say, as much as I possibly can. <laughs> so we put together a program of books and articles and history, and we interview the candidates before they're allowed to participate. And then they go off and they start learning. And we check in with them yeah. every month to and see where the called, learning is, is it? going. It's called the Master's Program. Oh, okay. um, and you become a Master of Cigars when you've completed it. So you go away and you <coughs> learn. And when our head of training feels that you're ready, an exam date is set. And you come <laughs> here <laughs> and you have to sit in front of three of us. And you do two or three hours of written papers. And then you do a live presentation set on various scenarios and we can interview you and ask you and you light and cut a cigar. And over the last five or six years, we must be up to 25, 30 masters now. Really? And what's been so interesting about the masters is quite often the masters are people who've worked in the hospitality industry who really have already achieved quite often a certain amount of education about wine and spirits. Mm -hmm. So they're naturally interested and curious about the way things work. But they want to learn more and more. And part of the master's program, they have to learn the size of every single Vitola de Galera that exists, Vitola de Salida. Yeah. The millimeters in inches, in ring gauge, every limited edition, every reserve, every grand reserve, everything that's ever released, they have to have it at their fingertips. So they're likely to be, you know, as knowledgeable as any consumer mm -hmm. they might come across. But what we've seen as a result of that is where you might traditionally have had a bar manager who dealt with the cigars. This is pre-ban and pre sort of, you know, big causes and things. Now what you have is the cigar sommelier, the guy who is responsible for cigars within this type of environment. And that is a job in and of itself. And then what we've seen is that if someone is opening a new shop or a nice hotel and they've gone to the trouble of building a humidor, they want a master in there. Mm. So they go and they look for a master. So it's become like being a wine sommelier. Yeah. It's become its own category yeah. of excellence. And when we do events with these masters, most of them are young, but their knowledge and their enthusiasm is so thrilling to see. And the hope behind this is that these guys will stay in this business because particularly in catering, people move around a lot mm -hmm. and they move around and out. You know, they will move to managing a hotel in Switzerland, you never see them again. Whereas with this way, we've, we've kept them in. And what we've seen is products like our house reserve, which I'll, I'll explain a little bit about, will now be being 
endorsed by these guys as much as it will by traditional retailers. Yeah. So we get a much wider, much wider level of expertise than we yeah. might have had before. So this is our this is our house reserve project, and and the idea behind this project was that every year we take a selection of cigars and we put them into what we call house reserve and we've done that for a long time and sometimes it was discontinued lines we just kept 20 or 30 boxes quite often it's the first release of a cigar the first time they've made a new cigar wide church or short church or cigars like that um, and sometimes it will literally be a carton of cigars that we might have lost sight of <laughs> and simon and i worked on a program of Age to Banos a few years ago. And Age to Banos was the idea that cigars of a certain age would be released. And this is an evolution of that. So this is H&F's House Reserve. And House Reserve has basically two categories, humidors, where we put together special collections of cigars, and then the House Reserve aged and rare cigars. And here, for example, with this box of Cohib Resplendidos, um, you can see straight away it's an old box just by the layout of the box which has changed quite a lot um, and then we have on the back the November 02 production date mm. um, on this box we have two EMS labels the 2003 is the time it would have left bond originally and then 2021 is the year that we were selling it um, so we only released them in 2021 and then the Revisado was from when the quality control technicians came from Cuba to manually by hand check every single cigar that we release under this program. And what we do on the box, so you can identify the box as a, as a collector, is we have a series of codes about what type of cigar it is. So the date of manufacture, because that's key, mm -hmm. the date it was released, the warehouse manager's signature, so Mr. Gaskin, wow. and then which category it falls under. So this was not a first release or a discontinued line or a limited edition, but it's got 15 years of mm. age on it. And then just so that they can be identified within a retail environment, um, we do a, a leaflet that explains the, the idea. And then we add a band to the foot of each cigar mm. that says House Reserve, because for retailers, it's important with this cigar, you can distinguish it from another Cohib Resplendidos because of the band design. But with other cigars, it's harder. So this, this labels it as H&F House Reserve. And try to release around 5,000 at a time. But, you know, it, it will only be a few boxes of each. A handful of each box will go out. Um, so 5,000 total a year, but across, across maybe the entire range. 10, 12 products. Okay. And we'll try to curate that collection so that within a release, you might have a couple of Cohiba, but a couple of limited editions and some small cigars and some bigger cigars so that you can meet different collectors or different mm -hmm. consumers, you know, likes and, and dislikes. And it's been, it's been a really exciting project yeah. because it has sort of cemented for me how precious these cigars are and also how important <coughs> looking after them is, yeah. because they go on being wonderful. Yeah. And are these destined for cigar shops to be sold as full boxes or lounges to be enjoyed as single sticks or a mix? Gives you the flexibility. I mean, the idea is by also having the band, you have the option to sell it as a single stick or a box. Um, and, and it's an interesting question to ask some of the retailers how they find they are selling those cigars. Yeah. I suspect mainly as whole boxes. Yeah. I would have thought that this is a, it, this probably quite often doesn't even get onto the shelf. It, <laughs> yeah. it will go into a retailer and he will call his, yeah. you know, Esplendidos yeah. customer and he will take the box. And what I hope you smoke What about this beautiful cabinet? Oh, well, this is <laughs> all of our Corona Gigantes. Um, this isn't, I mean, these cigars came into us in 99, but Unlike this box, which has the two EMS labels, this just has one because we cleared and released these in 2019. So we moved them for one reason, from one warehouse to another. Um, I mean, wish, wish I was smoking back then. <laughs> oh, I mean, 99. 
can you imagine? Yeah. I mean, and a cabinet of 50. I mean, as you said... And that's like a holy is, grail. It's I mean, the holy grail of cigars. And as you said, it's a discontinued line and it's got 20 years on it. And it's been in our warehouse since 1999. What's interesting is that it's been here since 1999, but it wasn't processed, essentially, till 2019. And what that really tells you is that 20 years ago, this wasn't... A, a huge seller. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the really fun things about cigars. You take the Hoyo range, the Du Deputy, the Du Mary, those cigars, Du Roi. They sat there forever. Yeah. And then suddenly the market has shifted a little bit to smaller mm -hmm. cigars. And, and everybody wants those cigars. So you never know what you've got. You know, we could put aside 5,000 Larenas and we could find out in 20 years that no one has any interest in them. So you're sort of, you're not trying to guess the future because ultimately, in my view, any cigar that carries a significant amount of age is very interesting to smoke and is going to be a pleasure. But you don't know what size or category is going to be successful or how it's going to age. I mean, this is one of your favourite cigars, isn't it? This is interesting because this was released originally as part of the, this was the original concept, Aged Habanos. So that was the first iteration of releasing older cigars. Mm -hmm. And now we've re-released it under the House Reserve. So this is, would have gone on to the market. 2019. Look at those. Look at those. I mean. Wow. They're so beautiful, beautiful, aren't they? And just look at the way that the Boulevard label is stamped on that. And this, the cabinet of 50s, they didn't ban. No, yeah, they didn't ban. And I love the way you'll, you'll always see on this cigar that pressing where the ribbon was. So when you smoke that cigar, it will just have the dent forever of the ribbon. How magnificent. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Well, Jim, I mean, what a privilege. This has been, I can't thank you enough. The only thing I wish would have been different about it is I would have had more of my voice. Oh, I'm sorry <laughs> for you. I mean, pollen. I, but I've been having London. too much fun. So here we are, but not to deter us uh, from enjoying everything it is that we love about London uh, and love about what you've been doing. And so I can't thank you enough for taking time out of, I know what is a busy day, a busy week, <laughs> to share this with us, the history, the tradition, um, the quality, the craftsmanship, I mean, it's just, I mean, what a treat. Well, I mean, thank you, honestly, as well, because it, it's, I don't very often in the middle of the day get the opportunity <laughs> to sit down and have this kind of conversation. Yeah. And it's a, you know, it's, it's a, not only is it a joy, and as I said earlier, a privilege for you to ask to do this, but it is really lovely to just take the time sometimes to, yeah. to reflect back because one is always moving forward. So something like today, you know, we've covered a lot. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. and for me, it's a bit like a sort of walk through the corridors of time. And I'm very grateful to you for that. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm so thankful that we were able to capture it uh, on video, of course, to share it on the YouTube channel so that, you know, I'm sure that thousands or hundreds of thousands of people will be able to to sit in, as though they were in this room with us, hopefully smoking a good cigar yes. and while enjoying this moment with us. Yes. And uh, you know, I'll probably be one of those people that, that sits back home, turns on my computer, and uh, just enjoy, enjoys this moment again. And thank you so much for that, Gemma, thank you. Well, it's a pleasure, and, yeah. and you're welcome here any time and, and I will I'm take um, you up on that <laughs> well I will I will I will go on a on a next time I know you're coming we'll, we could go through the old humidors because that is that's fun mm. there um. we have it on camera <laughs> you're on the you're on record <laughs> yeah mm. we did it for the talisman launch we thought let's no one's ever done it before so we were given the cuba lets different markets launch cigars so we applied we have a history of launching cohiba mm -hmm. here um right back to you know before siglo six was the first one i was here for but before that and then the bahikes were launched here um and then we had the robustos supremos and the talisman and we wanted to make the talisman party different and we thought what's never been done before is no one has put on display everything that's ever been released under the Cohiba 
brand. And we had, bar one or two items which we borrowed, we had everything that's ever been released wow. from the Bahike Humidor to the 50th anniversary, all the way back to the first box sold by Castro and auctioned and things like that. And, and it was really, it was a beautiful thing to see actually. I wish I'd been there. Well, the <laughs> next one, Kirby, I really yeah. hope that you'll be here for that. We will. We you will. let me know. I'll be on an airplane. Wow. Yeah. If I have to row across the Atlantic. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you an engine. You can attach an engine to your boat.